I remember working with a very famous CEO and he said, can you measure engagement? And I said, how many plants and operations have you visited in the last month? And he said, six or seven. And I said, could you rank them in the order of employee engagement? And he said, oh yeah, I can tell you the top one or two. I can tell you the bottom one or two and the ones in the middle are mixed. I can go give you a measure. I can give you a retention of good employees. I can give you productivity. I can give you some of those indicators. I can give you a survey, which is kind of a lead indicator, but you know it and you've got to get it better. You need employees to be engaged to go beyond their job descriptions. Uh, there, But, you know, so everyone's talking about employee engagement uh, there. But if you, and, and the, in the data which you shared today and some of the other data which I have seen, basically it had picked up a little bit. And then after COVID, it has more or less like fallen down. Okay. Or is it plateauing? Is it something which uh, companies should focus uh uh, as an important metric, uh, is it important in today's world with you know all the hire and firing and hiring going on there? You know, let's start off from there. You know, it's uh, it's always uh, uh, everything is always simple and complex. Uh, the simple line is, and you said it so beautifully, when an employee gives not just their hands and their feet and their brain. I mean, they give their hands and their feet. They show up. They give their brain. They give their ideas. If they give their heart and soul, something unique happens. And I think you have experienced that. I've experienced that. People talk about your, it's not a job, it's a mission. It's not, a, it's not work, it's a calling. And, and in fact, it's fascinating. I mean, this is what's simple. It's fascinating to, to see people who, who I'm, I happen to be sitting on a beach in California. Uh, I'm not vacationing, but it feels like it. And I see outside my window right now, probably 20 people early in the morning surfing. Hmm. If I were to look at those 20 people, they are probably not exceptional high school students. Because <laughs> instead of being at school, they're surfing. And their <laughs> teachers would say, they're demotivated. They're not working hard. Well, they're working very hard at surfing because that's where their heart and soul is. I think hmm. the same applies in organizations. We can have competence, that's our brains. We can have commitment, that's our hands and feet. We'll show up, but we need our heart and soul. And so at a simple level, every one of us have worked in a company that has captured our imagination. Volunteer organizations, not-for-profits, companies that are that are so exciting for us to work with that we, <laughs> we don't admit it, but we'd almost work for free. Um, mm. It's like the yeah. surfers, they're somebody says to the surfers, oh, you're not dedicated. And I look at the English teacher and say, they're not dedicated to you as an English teacher. <laughs> they're right. very dedicated. They get up at five o'clock in the morning and go surfing for four hours. That's simple. We get it. Complex is what do you do in an organization to make that happen? Hmm. Clearly it matters. When, when people give their best, it matters. How do you do that not in a crisis, and now I'll do this quickly. We all the research says, for example, in the utility industry, when the lights go out, there's a there's a hurricane, there's a storm, everybody rallies and they work hard to get the lights back on. How do you do that long term? How do you build that engagement, that commitment, whatever you want to call it, so that employees are are there not just with their brains, their hands and their feet, but their heart and soul? That is such a critical issue. And uh, when we get it, it's magical. It's magical because something good happens. How do you get it is tough. Right, right. No, and I, I think you you, you uh, made a good example, you know, and, and I also look at during the COVID, you know, as soon as it's stuck, I mean, there was no playbook uh, for how to manage that, okay? Uh, many teams, I mean, went beyond their, I, I just use the term again, the job description of, of what was needed, I mean, they and each of they're in their own roles the admin maybe the hr maybe so it was they never knew how to deal with such situation like this and but to motivate remote working which is now we are like taking it as a as a given but how do you get systems uh, to start working a large organization spread of I, I think they're the employees i mean that is an example of you know 
having employees who are engaged uh, and, and rising to the occasion. Absolutely. And I think one of the trends, and this is not a new topic. I remember, and I think I may have mentioned to you before, I had a chance once to listen to Peter Drucker before he passed away. And his comment was the most powerful motivation in the history of management was building the pyramids. <laughs> uh, look at the manual labor that built these incredible pyramids in, in Egypt. And, and, and I think this isn't a new topic. We used to talk about motivation. Then we talk about commitment. Then we talk about engagement, experience, well-being. I think people want their employees to have a good experience at work, whatever you call that. Engagement is, is the term we're using today. How do we go about doing that? Mm-hmm. Clearly, it matters. If, if you look at the correlations between employee engagement and customer engagement, the mm-hmm. correlations are often 0.6 to 0.8. If I'm an okay. engaged customer, the employees I interact with are probably also engaged. That's a huge correlation, and it's cause and effect. A highly engaged employee will work to make sure that I'm a highly engaged customer and disengaged employee. I happened to stay at a hotel recently where it, it doesn't take long to sense the engagement in a hotel. Uh, they weren't quick responding. They didn't answer my questions. And I'm going, well, I might leave the room a little bit messier. I shouldn't have said that. But, but yeah. And and on the other hand, you see the engaged employees who go out of their way to help and to, and to make your experience good. Leaders and organizations want to do that. And again, your brilliant work on recognition. How do you build the recognition systems that encourage some of that employee engagement without anybody having to observe people? I mean, I can get you engaged by standing over you with a hammer. And forcing <laughs> yeah, you to yeah. work, but sure. I want you to be engaged without the leadership direct supervision. True. Uh, so, so it, it's an important metric. I mean, the, the short answer to that is that it's an important metric. Companies should focus on it, but uh, we haven't seen it increasing. We, the disengagement numbers are increasing uh, there. I mean, why do you think that's happening? Or we have plateaued. I mean, we should not start even trying to get to the, you know, more engagement. This is the best. You are an employee. I am an employer. That's it. So let me, let's let not try to be a family, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, this is what you can get in a corporate level. Uh, you make a great point. First of all, the metrics. There's a lot of ways to measure it. Let me just suggest three very simple. One is you know it when you see it. Yeah. Uh, I just gave an example. You walk yeah. into a hotel. You walk into a restaurant. A business leader walks into one of many operations where she or he is leading. You can feel the engagement. And, 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 and so it's unobtrusive. It's there. Second, we can look at hard metrics, revenue per employee, retention of, retention of good people. Sometimes retaining bad people is not a good thing. But retention, so you got the hard metrics. Then you got the survey metrics. We, and a survey tries to solicit from the employees their opinions by asking questions and and Gallup and every every organization in the world, uh, the consulting firms all have surveys uh, mm-hmm. around employee engagement. They're changing, by the way. Let me just talk about metrics for a minute, but and then we'll talk about how engagement comes. The surveys often talk about satisfaction. Do you like your boss? Then they talk about skills. Does your boss give you skills to do your job? Then they talk about meaning. Does your boss provide you meaning? The most recent surveys that I think are really cool. Talk about active engagement. Think about those questions I just asked. Do you like your boss meaning? Does your boss give you meaning? Does your boss give you skills? All of that assumes that the organization is responsible for your engagement. My colleague Marshall Goldsmith and his team started talking about active engagement, that you, the employee, share the accountability for your engagement. So on the engagement survey questions, they asked the question, did I do my best? Five words. Did I do my best to build a relationship with my boss, to earn my pay, to work well with team members? And so the shift, does your boss give you skills? Does your boss or organization give you meaning? That's the boss's job. When Marshall looks at those questions called active engagement, did I do my best to work with my boss, to earn my pay, to build working conditions? That correlates with customer engagement and business outcomes higher than the other. 
I like those questions because engagement is a two-part street. The company has to do things to help you. Policies, procedures, we'll talk about that. But the employee also feels an ownership to say, am I doing my best to work in this company? And, mm-hmm. and so that for me is the metric. One, I still like the unobtrusive feelings. I remember working with a very famous CEO and he said, can you measure engagement? And I said, how many plants and operations have you visited in the last month? And he said, six or seven. And I said, could you rank them in the order of employee engagement? And he said, oh yeah, I can tell you the top one or two. I can tell you the bottom one or two and the ones in the middle are mixed. I can go give you a measure. I can give you a retention of good employees. I can give you productivity. I can give you some of those indicators. I can give you a survey, which is kind of a lead indicator, but you know it, you know it, and you got to get it better. Okay, I've talked about the metrics. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's fun no, to it, see what the metrics it, it are. Makes sense. And, 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 I, and, I, and I really love the active engagement part. I mean, uh, you know, I might have a bad boss. I might not like my boss, but you know, I like the company's mission. Okay, so I put in my best effort there. So uh, I, think I love it. That's a wonderful way to, uh, uh, you know, frame the question and getting the real, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, you must have done those, uh, look at the studies, the correlation between customer satisfaction and, and that, but, but active engagement, you know, I think, I think that's the way to go. Uh, what, let me tell you uh, the general research, just so that people see the value. If you get a 10% increase on employee engagement on a survey, so whatever survey you use, uh, and I, again, we, we say Gallup because they're kind of the standard. They've been around a long time. They're Gallup 12 items. You get a 10% increase. You'll get a 5% increase on customer engagement. So it's two to one and about a two and a half percent increase on financial performance. So it's about a two to one, two to one, two to one. So you say, I want to get a, you know, a, a, a five, per, well, let's say a 3% increase on my financial performance that's EBITDA. And that's a lot to get the 3%. I got to get a 6% on customers because dedicated customers buy more. And I got to get a 12% on employee engagement. Now it's not always exactly that, but in general, that's the pattern that we see. It's such a simple way you put it. I mean, it's uh, why HR should focus uh, uh, on the engagement. Uh, One thing on on the metrics, which you uh, bought about, and sometimes, and I have debated on this is the retention metric. So I try to give the example of like, you know, uh, we are married, uh, but we might divorce. Okay. We go our different ways, but as long as we are married, we should be in love. Right. <laughs> so, so, so is retention important or as long as the employee is there in the company, you know, that engagement oh, I, level. I love the metaphor. There are a lot of people who are married, but they're yeah. not in love. Yes, they're they're, they're 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 disengaged in the wedding. They're they're roommates, and right. uh, and and they cross each other and they share a meal. That's for me. That's a great metaphor, brother, because they show up. Yeah. They live in the same house. They rent. They they pay bills. They but there's not a great deal of personal affection. There's not the heart and the soul. I'm lucky enough. And by the I have to be honest. I've been married 48 years and. I should wow. confess it. There are days when I'm more in love and less in love. I've never had a day where I don't regret being married to my wife ever. But some days there's a little more heart yeah. than there are others. But but I think that's true with engagement. I love that metaphor. That's such a good metaphor. We're married. Are we in yeah. love? We're working yeah. here. Are we engaged fully? Absolutely. So I, I now, keep on. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Now, how do you get it? Huh. Yeah, uh, that's the question. We've talked about it matters. We've talked about metrics. And again, there are, there are so many studies of motivation and commitment and experience. You and I have talked before, and I love the idea of taxonomy. Taxonomy means simplifying complexity. So when I've looked at that engagement literature, I've said there are seven things. They're not magical. They stand for voice, V-O-I-C-E, vision. Give someone a sense of vision. Give someone a sense of meaning, purpose. Um, again, I, I think that that vision is so powerful. People work in not for profits, not for money, but for purpose, vision. Opportunity. Can I learn? Can I grow? Can I build my skills? Can I make my career happen? 
there's two eyes incentive money is true for some uh it's not true for everybody and it's not true for everybody in the same way all the time i'll bet part that you've been offered more money to do something else and you still do what you do Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but but money did i'll bet earlier in your life money may have mattered more uh yes. just to be clear impact a second eye vision mm -hmm. opportunity incentive impact am i making a difference if I do something here and I never get to see the outcomes, there's no efficacy. Is there impact? Community. Am I working with a leader and people I enjoy working with? Do I have a community? Do I have, do I share values? Is there a group of people here? I show up every day and we serve each other. We're a team and in the military um, and it's probably, well, the military is always a great example. They have the uh, I don't know what the term is in India, but the Navy SEALs, the Rangers, the Special Forces, who they're right. teams. The next C is communication. Do I know what's going on? Do I have information? And the final one, I'll do it again very quickly, vision, opportunity, incentive, impact, community, communication. I call it entrepreneurship. And what I mean by that is flexibility. Can I be treated entrepreneurially? Can I be treated in a unique way about where I work and how I work and clothes I wear, how critical is that? And so one of the things we found, and those are very close to the Gallup 12 or some of the other items, everybody is personalized. And this is the highlight I wanna to try to make on this podcast. Everybody personalizes those things, both in their life and for the employee. For some employees, money is an issue. Greed is good. We could make a movie about that. We could call the movie Wall Street and we'd be rich. Um, and there are some for whom money is so critical. There are others who just live for flexibility. I was uh, traveling recently and I happened to drive with, and I don't know the term in India, but it's Uber, uh, the, yeah. the drivers. And I'm sure India has the same system. Yeah. And so I, I love to ask people when I talk to them, what do you like about your job? And he said, I love this job. I work in construction during the day. This was a 5 a.m. drive. And I build houses or he's cement. I manage cement. But I go out in the mornings for three hours at my schedule. And I do whatever I want. And I make a little bit of money. And then I go to work. He loves the E, the entrepreneurship. He said, I'm my own boss. Um, he said that in a way and he got a bigger tip. I think that was a very <laughs> clever move on his part. But, but everybody has their own thing. And uh, I think as leaders, can we recognize the menu of choices that drive mm -hmm. engagement, vision, opportunity, whatever choices you have, and then can we create personalization for the employee? What matters to you? What's going to be meaningful to you? Is it a vision? Is it opportunity? Is it incentive? Is it impact? Is it community? Is it communication? Is it entrepreneurship or flexibility? And say, I'll make you a deal. If you bring your heart and soul, not just your brain and your hands, bring your heart, you'll get what you want. That's it. Absolutely. I, so I'm so lucky to have this conversation with you. I know, voice, I, I, I am in this space and, and somehow the, it, it was never there. I mean, the way you have put in all the seven points uh, are on the voice thing just makes it simple uh, again. And, and, and on the incentive part, which you talked about, some people it's money, some people it's uh, the flexibility, some people, uh, and I think the recognition fits in there. Okay, So there was this Gartner study, which, is, which says that, you know, if an employee is recognized at least once a quarter, uh, their engagement scores increase by seven percentage points. Okay, that's what they say. Engagement scores, not, not that. Okay, so the recognized, I mean, timely recognition for the right kind of thing. And people do, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you can do all the donkey's work and you're, no one notices you. I mean, recognition is a form of noticing someone, right? So, uh, you know, you're I, not I motivated. Love it. I love it. Uh, two thoughts. One, personalizing voice, and that's why I like voice. We personalize the voice, is a form of recognition. What matters to you right now? And it may vary. Earlier in my career, money mattered more than it does now. I like flexibility. I, I, I love that I can work wherever I am. <laughs> Sometimes that's on an airplane. Sometimes that's sitting in the ocean watching surfers. Sometimes that's uh, in a meeting in a hotel, but that matters. The other one, I love the concept of recognition 
as part of the incentive. Um, I'm going to give an example. An employee needs to be recognized, especially by their customers. So I'm going to call out Prazenjit for having done a great job. And so Prazenjit, I finally got your name right and I didn't say it right. How do you say the name? I want to say it right. Prazenjit. I think I, I, you're close enough. Yeah. I'm close enough. I, I called him Saha once, but that was his last name because it was easier. But, you know, he's done such a good job. Why do I do that? Recognition not one-on-one, -on -one, but to an outsider, often matters even more. I asked a group yesterday. I was in a, a session with a group of uh, 30 senior HR people. How many of you have an employee reporting through to you who's doing a great job? And they all raise their hand. How many of you have written a letter of recognition to that employee's mother? <laughs> and I said, let me draft it for you. Prazenjit, his mother, if she's still alive. I've worked with Prajanji for a number of years. He's one of the most talented, gifted employees I've ever worked with. He has skills. He has courage. He has ideas. He has values. I am sure he learned those from his dear mother as he was growing up. And you should be so proud. I mean, you could write the letter. I just yeah. did it yeah, yeah. and send it to his mother. And I asked the people in the class, what will his mother do with that? She'll post it on the door like a religious uh, symbol. She'll share it. Suddenly, that recognition makes him sit up and feel so proud. I've just tried to do that with him. As a leader, <laughs> yeah. are you giving recognition in ways that matter most to the employees? One person said to me once when I had raised that issue, said, please don't send it to my mother. Send it to my father. <laughs> and I thought, okay, okay, I don't want to get involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I love recognition. So how I love the recognition. I just wrote down 7%. That's a great study. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what are you doing to help build that recognition? What, what are you and, and Vantage Circle doing to help make some of that work? I'm going to so, ask you a question. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, for us, what we have seen is, and I think in, in one of our previous conversations, uh, I had mentioned this, that the whole RNR or rewards and recognition is how they club it together. The rewards part has been getting more and more focus. Okay, as I said, because of vendors pushing it, the money is there. Uh, the long service awards, the five year, ten year, that's the focus of that. Okay, we are saying that is not the focus of RNR. Okay, the the first R, the recognition, is the more important part, and we are trying to help create some frameworks, okay, where just like you have given this nice framework of employee engagement, a voice, okay, uh, thing which you've said about, we're saying for the recognition, we are giving this framework for you to think about it. You have to personalize it, of course. We, when we say, do you want coverage? Think about it. Do you want all employees to be included? Do you want only white collar employees to be? Okay. It's up to you to decide, but I'm just giving you that this is a factor. It's important. You decide what you want on that, right? How do you incentivize? Is it incentivizing just by the money? So do you give me $100 when I'm earning $200,000? Or do you make it something more, uh, you know, exclusive? You know, I'm in the President's Club. Okay, I've been, you know, got to the President's Club. That is more important to me. Again, you also have to think about maybe that $100 for the guy who's earning $20,000 is useful. Okay not for the guy who's earning $200,000 there. So how do you, uh, you know, how do you incentivize these people? And, and we've also talked, talked about something like personalization. You know, tools are there to automate things, but it should not be automated to the extent of a Facebook birthdays, you know? So now I get birthday wishes from everyone because we are connected on Facebook, right? But <laughs> one phone call, I mean, there are like four or five people who will call me. I remember those, right? Others, I appreciate that they got the notification. At least they wished me there. But these five people called me up. So we're trying to give this framework to people and say that this is how you should look at it. You can decide which, which factor is more important for you and which is within your capabilities to do it. So that that's our focus, recognition. Part. I love it. I love it. And as I trigger with that, you just described for me the personalization, which starts, number one, with a business leader saying, I want engaged employees. Frankly, if you're a business leader who doesn't say that, you've got a problem. So yes, this matters to me too. Look at every employee as an individual. What will be the most meaningful to you? Is it vision, opportunity? What matters to you in terms of recognition? 
Uh, one company I was with, I gave an example, and this is in America more than in India, but between the end of November, which we celebrate with a Thanksgiving holiday and Christmas, those two weeks are the slowest in the hotel industry because uh-huh. people will travel at Thanksgiving, they'll travel at the end of the year. So one company went and bought 100 room nights in hotels across the country. And then they called the employees and now they're looking at employees who, who have families, who have demands, and they just want a two night vacation with their spouse or with, hopefully, I I won't say hopefully whoever it's (laughs) with, but they said to the employees, this is what matters to you. And, uh, and, and I think if I'm a leader, look at my employees and say, it's not just about money. Money could be a piece. I love your idea for 20,000 dollar a year employee, a hundred dollars may be a lot right. for a $200,000 employee. Maybe that room night matters. Maybe. The, and I love the personal letters. I, I get so frustrated when I do talks, somebody often at the end of the talk gives me a thank you card that's sealed, which means they wrote the thank you before I gave the talk. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and I go, that's not very helpful. You wrote the thank you note last night. You haven't even heard me talk yet. You right. got to make it real. You got to make the recognition real and, and then Absolutely. publicly share it and let people let people see what they're doing. And, and I hope your company can build that topology of options. Here's the menu of recognition beyond birthday wishes, which are great birthday cakes. We all like, frankly, if it's structured and formal, I'm not going to find as much meaning than if it's personal for sure. me. And, uh, I, I think hope I, we, we, we hope to. I know it'll take some time, but uh, we are there for the long haul. So hopefully we'll be able to shift. Uh, or so so I need you to. I need you to send me Praz, Prazenjit's mother's address, and I'll send a card to her talking about I will what do a great. That. I will do that. I love that. <laughs> and we'll just take you know photocopies of that and put it up on our uh, office. There. Uh, absolutely. So, and and on, on the personalization, I think it's also a little bit on the, not little bit, I think on the cultural thing. So some countries, you know, it's it's different. The voice is there. So what you've talked about on the voice part of it, all these factors matter in every culture, every country. Some might just more, matter more uh, in some companies, uh, sorry, in some cultures. Uh, there, you know, Japanese culture, Indian culture, U.S. culture. So very different uh, uh, there, you know. So, I, I love so. that. I mean, there's work that's great work. Eric Hofstede and others have shown on four or five dimensions how cultures differ. Uh, America tends to be more independent, the entrepreneurship, than Japan, which tends to be right. more structured. Um, and time frame. America tends to be short term, sometimes in China and, and Japan. Asian, I'm picking Asian. I could pick India. Tends to be more long term. So, yeah, I think those differences are, that's part of the personalization. That is so important to recognize. Absolutely. But last question. So why are these numbers not going up, the engagement numbers? I don't know. Neither do you. <laughs> uh, because we haven't been listened to enough. And and here's the answer that I kind of give, because I know you asked me to think about this. You use the metaphor marriage. I'll use the same. Divorce rate for those who are together in the United States has stayed about 50% for decades. Mm-hmm. It changes mm-hmm. five or 6%, but it's plateaued there. I think in, and, and in India, it's about 80 to 90%. The, the marriage rate is yeah. high. Yeah. Um, so somebody made a joke once where, and it's not true in India anymore, but arranged marriages are better than planned marriages because your mother's no better. <laughs> That's not true. I know, but, uh, and it would be interesting, but I bet even in India, the, the marriage rate has stayed pretty consistent. It's not easy to build relationships that work. Yeah. And I love your comment. We can be together in a marriage, but not engaged. And we can be at work, our knowledge, our hands and our feet, and not fully engaged. And so when employees have more discretion, and I think COVID heightened that, I'm working at home. I don't have a team. I'm, I'm independent. When somebody calls a search firm or a friend with another job, it's I'm not leaving my team. Uh, because I'm still in, in, in my place. And even back at work with hybrid that we've played with the last few years, I think employees are saying, I have more discretion. I wish it could go up. Uh, so do you. Why do you think it's plateaued? It's really just kind of flat. It goes up four or five points, but it's still fairly flat. 
I mean, I, I also don't know the answer, but I just see it like uh, how my father was. I think the economy, the country progresses. I think things differ. So your your divorce rates are fifty percent there. I'm pretty sure India is also in that direction in one day. So my parents' generation, I didn't find too many people. I mean, I, I could count in my like hands how many divorced people I knew in my father's generation in India, right? But wow. now it's very common. So in my friend circle, when in my social gatherings, I will have, in in ten couples, I will definitely be having one person who's divorced. Okay, mm. so I think the society. I not say improves or what or progresses, but society as it you know moves forward uh, in certain direction. I think things happen now. You talked about the marriage rates remaining, sorry, divorce rates remaining same, but maybe the number of single people are increasing the percentage. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're not even getting married. That's uh, a great right? comment. Great comment. Great comment. And you know, I just saw some work that was posted yesterday. I don't know when it was done by Gallup again, who's the standard. It was around expectations. Yeah. we could do a whole session. How do you manage? Because some people get married and say, I'm going to get married and I'll be in love every day of my life and things will be perfect. Uh, no, yeah. you know, the honeymoon, <laughs> the honeymoon ends and I'm still married and I'm still in love, but, but it's not a, it's not the same kind of romantic kind of thing. And the same is true of expectations. Not every minute of every day of every job is going to be the great. This would, this is already the highlight of my day. I'm early in the day. You're late in the day. I hope it's an ending highlight for you, a beginning highlight for me. But, but not every minute of every day is going to be delightful. I was on an airplane last night for four and a half hours. I have to right. be honest. That was not a highly engaging experience. <laughs> it was, uh, and that's part of the job. Get the expectation right. And such a lovely comment to end the conversation you know, expectations from both sides you know uh, companies the corporate should also think about what they need from the employee and, and in today's context what should be the expectation would, would i want them to work 12 hours in the culture also i mean jack ma had said that nine to nine for six days a week right and then he got fired or something so uh so it, it, it's like i think the expectation from both sides is very important I love it. Relationship we could talk a long time about it. it is so delightful to learn with you i've uh, every time i talk to you i have my page of notes of things that you've shared with me that i'm learning so uh thank it's you. an honor for me you know it's so fascinating every discussion and i get excited and like today's call okay what will i learn new so absolutely amazing uh, conversations with you thank you dave 